In this video, we'll finally start to get into the actual Calc 2 material. Volume is where we're starting. It's a bit of a tough section. It's not the easiest. It requires a lot of visualization, but we're really gonna take our time with this. Just as I'm trying to give you plenty of time to get a little used to the review, get yourself back into calculus thinking, reminders of derivatives, antiderivatives, well, even as we get started into this technique, we're still going to take our time to make sure there's time to let these ideas settle. So I will refer to a few pictures in the book because the book does have some good drawings and visuals that help with this section. But overall, you could really use that in addition to my notes. And there'll definitely be some, I don't want to say differences, but just different examples to try and keep you on track. The first thing, I feel like the book just kind of jumps right in and starts talking about volume. And I think it would be a little beneficial to us to still take a little step backwards to lead us to how we're going to get there. The first thing is that the book just throws us an integral of area dx becomes a volume function. But just, just thinking about this for a moment, that where we got the area under the curves we started off by taking not nice shapes, all these little curves and twists, and by trying to cut them into nice clean rectangles. Now it wasn't perfect, and that's why we had over and under estimates, but by treating them like rectangles, we were able to use known geometric formulas. Rectangles have a simple area formula base times height. So you'll see once we get going, that once we get the volume set up, we're gonna try and do things similar. In this first technique, we are going to literally chop the figure. This is my own term, this technique, this idea of chopping. But then this other term, the disc washer method, if we're chopping correctly, that's what we're going to be left with. We're going to be left with some sort of disc or some sort of a washer, and we have nice volume formulas. I'll go over them, but we have nice volume formulas for those and that we could use those, cutting them up, breaking them up into smaller pieces to then find the total volume, and that is exactly what an integral does. Okay, but again, several steps before we get there. First things first, just a little understanding about how our coordinate system works and make a few quick points. So that if I just draw a random x, y axis and pick a point somewhere, Generically, I just call it x, y. So that random point. How far is that point above the x-axis? The answer is y. Whatever the y value is, if this is the point, maybe it's 1, 3, that point is 3 units above the, uh, the x-axis. So that this distance is represented by the y-coordinate. Similarly, if I said, how far is this point from the y-axis? Well, that's what the x-coordinate does. That distance would be measured by x. So again, if this was the point 1, 3, that point would be one unit away from the y-axis. Remember, when we're talking about distance from points to lines, we look at the shortest line, which is always a perpendicular line. So I'm not measuring the distance from here to the y-axis here. I'm going directly across. And same thing, when I'm trying to figure out how far this is from the x-axis, I'm not going on any kind of a slant. I just go straight down. So that's the first point. But watch this, because this comes up a lot in this section, and there's a lot of easy misunderstandings, but it's all about what distance do we want. And if we're just measuring the distance from the x or y axis, it is that simple. But what if I had another line up here? What if this was the line y equals l? And I want the distance from that line to this point. Well, now it's a little more work. And again, just to use a real number, let's say that's the line y equals 4 and we're still treating this as one comma three. Well, then this distance is one. Whenever we put numbers in, it always makes it a lot easier and we realize what our big picture is. But what did I just do? If this distance is three and this line is y equals four, how did I get that as one? 
I took this value because just as I knew from here to here was three, from here to here would be four. This y value given by that horizontal line, that's exactly what I'm using. So this is y equals four. That would be it's four units from the x-axis to this line, and it's three units from the x-axis to this point, which leaves one unit, or generically, L minus Y would be this distance. Don't worry too much about the L and the Y, it's the concept. So when we're trying to apply this later on, you realize, oh, not here, that would give me the distance to the X axis, I need the distance between these two lines, or this point and that line, okay? So, big distance minus this piece gives us the other piece. Conversely, adding these two smaller pieces together gives us the big distance. And I could do that same thing on the, with a vertical line and the x coordinate. So let me stick one more line in here. That was y equals l. Let's call this one x equals k. And I want to know what is this distance. Well, Another good reminder here that'll come up, horizontal lines are y equals a number, vertical lines are x equals a number. It's very easy to goof that up when we start doing our volume problems. You'll see that in just a little bit. But overall, this setup, the point to the y-axis, the distance is x. This line to the y-axis, the distance is k. So the distance from the point to this line would be k minus x. Big piece minus this little piece gives me the other. If this is the line x equals 5, and that's the point 1 comma 3, this distance would be 4 units. Okay, good start. Just talking about a little bit of distance, and we'll see how that comes up. But now let's get into the volume part. How do we end up with three-dimensional objects when we're drawing in two dimensions? And what we are going to do, this is not the only method. There are people who have been in AP Calculus who may have seen some others. There's a lot of little twists that can be done to this. But what we are going to do, we are always going to start with some trapped area. Sometimes that area will be nicely trapped by like the X and Y axis and some curve. Sometimes it'll be multiple curves along with some horizontal, I'm sorry, horizontal and vertical lines. But in some way, we are going to either just be given a picture with a trapped area or we'll be given curves and that we have to start by getting that trapped area. And then once we do that, we will then take that trapped region. So this is step one. Step two, we will take the trapped area and revolve that around some given axis of revolution. Lots of times that axis of revolution will be the X or Y axis, but again, not always. We may revolve around the line, Y equals two or X equals three. Those things will come up. So that's what we do. And when we actually do this revolution, the idea is you fill in everywhere your trapped area touches. So let's jump right in. Let's do a few generic pictures to get things started, get our formula set up, get our situation, and then we'll finish with a couple of examples. This is a lot to get used to. Again, this is not an easy section to start with, but take your time, get used to the volume setup in the first place. 5.3 will give us a secondary technique for finding volume. And when we finish that, We'll put all of our information together and then see how these problems, I don't want to say how they mix together. It's more how you decide which technique works best for you. We will see there are a few problems that only one technique would work, but any problem that I give you, either technique will work. It'll just be your preference, which one you see, which one makes more sense to you. So again, we've got a lot of building that we're going to do. So generic picture. 
Let's keep this first one fairly simple. Let's just keep my picture, this little hook, this vertical line, and the y-axis. I'm sorry, and the x-axis. This is my initial trapped region. You'll notice as we keep going, going along, I highly recommend you shade your trapped region, okay? There are a lot of little differences that people like to point out and some people, how much do they have to draw? How little can they get away with? I think we all need to get a good drawing in the first place and at least show our trapped region. So there is my trapped region. And now I'm going to revolve that around the x-axis. So when I do that, this, the way to revolve, it's like, again, this literally comes up out of the paper, swings up towards me, back down flat on the paper, and then into my desk through the paper and then back around. So this is where I said, your book gives you some better pictures here. I'm not a very good artist, but to try and think three-dimensionally, I start off by literally doing a flip so that all this flips down here and then this is my direction of roundness. Everyone we do is gonna be revolved around an axis, so we'll always have some circular aspect to our picture. This would have that circle kind of at its back here. Now again, I know this is not a particularly good picture, but can you see something here? Can you think of an object, a three-dimensional object that might look like this? maybe a bullet perhaps, or maybe like a little bit of a bottle cap, but not perfect. Most bottle caps are a little bit more square. But this, maybe this is like a volcano on its side or a hill on its side, something like that. If it was more like this, that would be more of our traditional volcano going up, but now it's on its side. So hopefully we're seeing that. And like I said, that's where how well can you draw? You don't have to draw super well. I think at a minimum, getting your initial shaded region, I definitely like to get the reflection. And I use this little circle symbol to always keep track of where my roundness is. So this is not a perfect shape. If I just said, what's the volume of this figure? Well, I don't think many of us have a volume of bullet-like figure memorize it. They don't have that formula. It's not something you find in the front of a book or something like that. But what can we do here? It may not look perfectly like this, but this has similarities to a cylinder. I should have drawn this as a dash to show this is deep in the picture. But there is a little cylinder. And a volume of a cylinder, well, volume, big picture on volume, if you have a nice regular figure and you just build up on that figure, the volume is the area of the surface times the height. So for instance, I've got this little pen box right here and this is a very nice rectangular box. So the base is a rectangle, so the area would be length times height or ba uh, length times width or base times height, whichever way you look at it, but I'll focus on it as length times width and that third component is that extra dimension of height. So that this becomes length times width times height. And that is how we get the volume of a nice rectangular shape. Your book, a shoe box, something like that. This one, this, or you know, like your soda can, something like that, any kind of a cylinder is built on a circle. So the area of the circle is pi r squared and then you get this extra component height so that the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi r squared h. I am going to use this in this picture to get our first formula. So again, this is not a cylinder, but what can I do? Well, what if I chop it? Hence, that's why I call this technique chopping. What if I literally thought about taking the shape, taking a big meat cleaver out, and literally chopping pieces across its axis of revolution? So again, I'll pull out my red pen, and I'll just draw a couple of lines here. So if I chop this like that, 
the red marks are me literally taking my saw or my cleaver and literally attacking and chopping this shape. Now it's not perfect because these new pieces are still not cylinders, but they're close, right? And this is where, again, everybody, if you flip into the book, page 368, they show a sphere being broken up into discs like this and how they smooth off the edges. So this is not a perfect disc, but if I flatten it off here and here, now it's like if you go to the gym, it's like one of the weight plates that you're loading up onto a barbell. And then this one, if I smooth out these sides, that would be a little bit of a smaller plate. Smooth out these sides, a smaller plate. Smooth out these sides, a smaller plate. So when I smooth these out, I'm getting approximates, but let's just look at each individual piece. Individually, they are completely filled in from top to bottom. So I'm getting a disc. And again, a disc is really just a small cylinder. So I'm going to use the area times the height. But the height of this disc is this piece. It's the thickness. The height that I'm thinking of in this formula corresponds to the thickness of this disc. So this disc, well, this is its thickness. Then this is the thickness of the next disc. Then this would be the thickness of the next. Then this would be the thickness of the next. And this is not a coincidence. This is just like we saw with area. We try and break these up into equal pieces. So that if this is the X coordinate A and this is the X coordinate B, that these, the thicknesses here, would be like the bases in the rectangles when we did area. And we've already got notation for that. That we use delta X is equal to B minus A over N. And that delta X would correspond to, again, this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, but that is the height in the disc when we pull it out. And now when we start looking at the area, oh, and by the way, I'm using delta X. We will notice once we get going, we make, make our chops in this direction, and then the thickness would be delta Y. So that'll be something we bring up. But first example, let's keep it basic. Let's stick with X for right now. So I've got this disc set up and I figured out that the thickness is delta X, which will become DX when we set up our integral in a few minutes. The area, well, the area is pi R squared. So I need to figure out what R is. But notice in my picture, in my first disc, R would be from here to here. In my second disc, R would be from here to here, then here to here, then here to here. They're all different values, but where am I going to? Every single time, I'm going to a Y value on the curve, right? That's why we're talking about this up here. I'm looking, the radius can be measured as the distance from this middle line. The axis of revolution will always be your midline. Whenever you revolve around that, that, that line will then be the middle. So my radius, I could go from here to here, but it's always a better habit to go to your original picture. We are, don't have any curve information in this example. This is still generic, but you would already know about this curve. You'd have to do work to think about this curve, the one I got when I started doing the revolving part. So all of these would be the Y value from the same curve. So just in this example, this is not always true, my R would be whatever the function is that was used to make this, fit, this picture to use to make this piece of the curve when we started to make that trapped region. So that's what it would be generically here, but now I'm gonna look at. So the volume of one disc would be pi r squared times delta x, or again, delta y. This example is delta x. We'll get to one where it's delta y, but that's just one disc. How am I gonna get the volume of the whole figure I'll add the volumes of all these disks together. So I'm back to a summation. I is the disk I'm on. N is gonna be the number of disks that I cut. I'm getting pi 
pi r squared times delta x, or again, delta y. So this is the volume for each disk. Add all those disks together, and that gives me an approximate, but we're not gonna bother with left sum, right sums, and over and under approximates here. We're gonna jump right to the final piece. How do I go from an approximate on the volume of this figure to the exact? It's the same thing we did with area. Sorry, I'm just letting that plane pass by. It's the same thing we did with area. The more cuts that I make, the more chops that I make, the more disks that I chop this into, the closer I'll get to the actual final volume. So when I take the limit as n approaches infinity, that is our full formula. Now I'm gonna to jump to the integral that that gets, but this is our volume by disk method. There's the generic formula. I'm sorry, here is the specific definition that we're using, and that leads to this formula. We still had bounds A and B. Pi R squared, very often this R will involve some functions, but we'll still just leave that as pi R squared, and the delta X will become a DX. The only other possibility here, or, C to D, this would just be if we did something, let's say I took this region and I revolve that around the Y axis, I get a very similar picture that we had over here, but the orientation has changed. Instead of the roundness being over here, now the roundness is up here. So if you wanna get disks out of this, now you'd have to chop horizontally, you'd still end up with disks, but now delta y would be your thickness. So now c and d would be y values. And when we're x values, a is our leftmost x, b is our rightmost x. If we're in terms of y, c is our lowest y, and d is our highest y, I'll still have the same pi r squared, but then we'll have a dy at the end. So this is not easy. I said it at the beginning. You've just watched a whole bunch of instruction. I just, I wanna get into the washer method before I start getting too many specific examples and start to get some practice here. But it's very easy to get a little overwhelmed, but stay with me. Stay with me through the washer. You'll see not much changes here, okay? and we'll end up with a washer formula that'll come in a very similar way, and then we'll get a few problems. And again, book has good problems, especially that idea of smoothing it out. I just made reference to the page uh, 368, the visual. Not only do they smooth it out, but they also show that sphere when it's broke into five disks versus 10 disks versus 20 disks. By the time you're looking at 20 disks, again, to our eyes, you're almost essentially looking at that exact same perfect round sphere. And the last little thing I wanna say before I keep going is again, this is what the book was talking about. They just set up a generic formula, integral A of X or A of Y, DX, DY. That's all they set up. And they expect you to realize that in this case that the area is the pi R squared. I think it's very worth our while to keep these formulas a little more handy, to just recognize that when we're getting our picture and then deciding how to chop, because that's our only technique we know yet, how do we get our disks, how do we chop, then decide if your thickness is your delta X or delta Y, then you start addressing your R value and your bounds, and then we could finish by getting the integral set up. Do not dismiss all of that. Again, I know we haven't finished yet, we haven't started the problem, but the setup is just as important, if not even more important than the solution is. When we get our first quiz, I'm gonna give you like six to eight of these types of problems, ask you to set up all of them, but then only, so you'd be done once you get this integral set up, and then you'll just solve a couple of them to show me that you know how to solve integrals. Okay, so saying a lot, but now let's, let's move on and let's take a look at a washer, and then we'll get those examples. 
So again, I'm still gonna look at a generic picture. We'll come back and put some specific functions in a few minutes, but one more generic picture. So here's some function f of x, but this time let's use the y-axis and a y equals line, and let's get this as our trapped region. So it's a triangular-ish. This has a little bit of curve to it, but it still has a little bit of a right triangle feel to it. But still, getting your area set up, so I just did that for us, and let's once again revolve this around the x-axis. And now when I take this up out of the paper, flip down onto the paper, and then through and around, and I'd end up with something that looks kind of like this. And this is empty space. This is why I was suggesting it's a really good idea to shade in your trapped region. Because if you just draw this picture and flip it, and then people start doing their work like this is the solid figure. And this almost looks like the bullet we just had in the previous. This is probably like the cast from that bullet. You make the bullet in here, drop the bullet out, and here's the leftover cast. So maybe this looks like, um, again, some sort of like an open bowl, perhaps. Maybe something a little fancier because it's got this thicker glass at the bottom and it's thinner on top. But some sort of an open shape. I could literally stick my pen into here. I would eventually hit the bottom. There is a solid bottom here, but this is all empty space here. It's solid up here, it's solid through here, because that edge, that was a solid edge that went around, but I've got empty space in the middle. So now, like I did on the previous one, if I chop across the axis of revolution, axis was here, we chopped down to go across this horizontal line. In the second quick one that we did here, this was my axis, so I needed to go horizontally across this vertical line. I know there's a lot of horizontal and vertical, but chops, you always have to cross perpendicular across your axis of revolution. So to chop this figure, I'm gonna to need to make my chops like this. But now when you look at those chops and think about what we were suggesting, and again, good pictures in the book, you look a little further ahead, I believe it's page 370, they show a couple of these figures. And when you are not solid, in the previous one, all this was shaded, so solid top to bottom, that gave me a disc. But in this one, empty space, just a little bit of empty space, more empty space, more empty space, more empty space. Doesn't matter if it's a lot of empty space or just a little, but when you've got shaded on the outside and empty space in the middle, you're ending up with a washer or a donut if you prefer. Some people call this the donut method as well, but I think it's more commonly known as the washer method. So now I've got a washer. And if you want, you could shade this in the same way that represents, maybe this is this first one where it's only a little bit of empty space. One of these later ones, this would be a lot thinner outside here and a lot bigger open hole in the middle. But whichever way you prefer, I still kind of like to keep track of what's in the middle. So I've got the x-axis running through the middle here. I still have to think about thickness, and it's still the option of delta x or delta y. These, you're, you're chunky, cutting off chunks of x's, so these are again delta x's. But what's the big difference? What is really the big difference when you're talking about a disc and now moving into this? and looking at a washer. The disc was completely solid, so we just did a pi r squared. The washer has this empty hole. It's a big circle with a little empty circle in the middle. So to get the area, technically this is called an annulus. To get the area of this annulus, you take the area of the big circle minus the area of the little one. So we just set this up as pi capital R squared minus pi little r squared. That gives me the area times my thickness. So now my volume by washer would just be that. Area times thickness, and again, 
even though this particular example is delta x, we have to be aware of the possibility of delta y. That can certainly come up. That gives me the volume of one washer, but I want to add all those together to get an approximate for the volume of the whole figure. But then to get away from the approximate, take the limit, and that becomes our volume by washer. So volume by washer. Actually, let me even write it out. Volume, so that we don't just look at one washer, we're looking at the whole figure. The volume of this figure by the washer technique will equal, we'll still have the definite integral, and in this one with this x setup, we'd still have a to b, the leftmost x to the rightmost x. And in an up-down situation, we'll just use c to d. And just to quickly draw one of those out, if I had something like this and wrap that around, sorry, if I had this and I revolve that around the y-axis, that exact same setup, like we saw with the first one, how I flipped that and got a similar picture, this is very similar to this one. But now you would have delta y as your thickness here, and you would have your c to d as your balance. So still getting the definite integral, still big picture, same principle. And my R's in this one, capital R, the center to the extreme edge of the shaded region. Center to the extreme edge of the shaded region. In this particular one, we're getting a consistent value. Sometimes it'll be a curve. Again, we just got to play it for what it is. Each one we look at individually. And then inside, center just to this curve. Center just till I hit the shaded region. Center just till I touch the shaded region. So that's how we'll be finding capital R and little r. We'll still need the picture and we'll be looking and just like the first one, it's always easier to go back to the original picture. That's where you have better information as opposed to trying to figure out information in some way that you reflect it. So again, let's stick with it. So volume by washer, we've got our definite integral, either case, we're just gonna use pi capital R squared minus pi little r squared, capital R for the radius of the big circle, little r for the radius of the little, and then that delta x would become a dx, or in the y case, the delta y becomes a dy. So again, not easy. Lot of little pieces here. When you go to solve, the pi is always a coefficient. You can kick the pi out in front in any of these and kind of get that out of your way. Same thing here. They have a pi are in both pieces, so you could factor it out of both and kick it out in front. So that'll be something when we get to solving. The little generic examples I've done, I've only revolved around the x and y axis. So we're gonna mix it up. So we see that's not the only way we do it. So this contains all the information, but now I'm gonna move into a second part and we'll start doing a few problems.